Hello friends, I'm Rod Marshall, president of Alabama Baptist Children's Homes. Did you know that there are over 6,000 children in the state's foster care system? But did you also know that there are 3,000 Alabama Baptist churches? Friends, this is a problem that we can solve, but we need your help. In 2031, our ministry will celebrate our 140th anniversary. And it's our goal, it's our dream and our vision that by 2031, we will be caring for a thousand children a year through our foster care homes. Now I know that not everybody's called to be a foster parent, but every follower of Christ is called to do something to bring hope to those 6,000 children in foster care. So maybe it's time for you to get out of the stands, get off the sidelines and join us on the field, get in the game and restore hope and bring joy to 6,000 children in foster care. Thank you and God bless you. Let's all stand and worship this morning.
Y'all may be seated. Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. It is so good to see some new faces in the choir. And uh, I know I'm getting older and I need glasses, but I think there's a few more spots available. But you can tell some of these people are novices. And because I have a good friend up there, and he is not going to mind me making a joke of him. Terry Carley, would you stand up? <laughs> would somebody help him put on his choir robe right? <laughs> pull, pull that back. I tell you what, these new choir members. Take him out of leadership, and he don't even know how to sit in the choir. <laughs> God bless him. Oh, well, good morning, and if you are with us for the very first time, we would love to know that you are here, and I would love to reach out and make contact with you. Uh, an easy way to do that is if you would just text that to us. We will get your information, and I will reply to you. If you don't hear from me, that means for some reason I didn't get it, and you're Feel free to just walk up to me and say, hey, how you doing? We'd like to know you're here and just say thank you for being here and see if we can help you in any way possible. Just a couple of announcements. We have our ladies conference coming up next Saturday, and we invite all of our ladies to be a part of that. And today is the last day to sign up if you want to. Friday. Friday. Thank you. Friday. I tell you what. <clears throat> can't get a good choir member. Can't get a good announcer. <laughs> but. <clears throat> We're just seeing if y'all on your toes. Just want to make sure. So Friday, ladies' conference. Uh, mainly they told me to make sure I remind you to sign up for a meal. This is the last day to sign up for the meal. So if you haven't signed up for that, we would ask that you would go ahead and sign up. You have seen that we have been uh, promoting the videos from the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. You have heard the need that is in our state with foster children. I know of nobody better to help with the foster crisis in Alabama than the churches of Alabama. Uh, and I know everybody's not called to be a foster parent. I know that. But what we are trying to help people in the church understand is there's a lot of ways to help the system and to help other foster parents other than just being the foster parent. You might find out God's calling you to be a foster parent, but there's a lot of ways to help. So we do have a class here on February 4th, which is right around the corner. There's a little uh, marquee, little sign-up thing out there where all you have to do is take your phone and use that QR code and get signed up. But I would ask that you, if you could find time to be involved, at least go. This is just one class, and it'll help you know more about foster parenting here in Alabama through the Alabama Baptist Children's Home. So that'll be a great help. At this time, Miss Kate, if you if you'd just come down, and children, if you'd come down. Okay. I'm going to try to do a good job so I don't get called out up here. <laughs> been a couple weeks since I've been up here, and Brother Wayne's calling people out this morning. I'm like, oof. I'm just messing with you. How is everybody? You doing good? All right. Bought some things with me today. Who knows what these are? Hopefully everybody. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. We all know what these are, right? What are they used for? What's this used for? Teeth. To do what with your teeth? Brush them. Brush them. You're cleaning your teeth up, right? Can sometimes our mouth get really messy? Yeah. Um little bit of insight. Uh, I have a dental hygiene degree. I've worked in dental hygiene for about 10 years before I swapped career paths. Um, but your, meth, your mouth can get in a mess sometimes. That's a can get to be really dirty, a really messy place. Um, how many of you like Oreos? How many of you can eat just one Oreo? I <laughs> mean, I eat like a sleeve of Oreos at a time. Like, I could probably sit and eat a whole box. It's a guilty pleasure of mine. But what happens when you eat Oreos? Have any of you ever eaten like a, a bunch of Oreos and you went in the bathroom and you're like, woo, my mouth is a mess, right? You may have like Oreos all in, in between your teeth and on the parts where you chew your, chew your teeth or chew your food. And then you've got Oreos like around your lips and stuff. So not only is the inside of your 
mouth a mess. Outside's getting kind of messy too, right? Sometimes our lives can get like that. We start getting messy, right? We mess up. Whoever's made a mess out of something, made a really bad mistake, and like that mistake turns into another mistake, and you're just like, whoa, spiraling out of control. Me, my life's been a mess before. Sometimes can still get pretty messy. But God is like this toothbrush, y'all. You're like, whoo, did she just compare God to a toothbrush? Huh? Well, what does God do for us? He loves us, right? And through loving us, he cleans those messes up for us, right? What if I took this toothpaste and I put it on your finger and I said, here, brush your teeth with your finger in a toothbrush or in, in toothpaste. He's looking at me like I'm crazy. I am. That's okay. But cleaning your teeth with your finger, it's not going to get all those Oreos off, is it? No, you need something to help you with it. And that's where God steps in. We can't clean up our messes on our own, guys. You can try. You might get a little bit cleaned up, but are you really getting the job done? Who can get the job done? God. And that brings me to another point. How many times a day are you supposed to brush your teeth? Two. Oh, thank goodness. We know. We know. But just because you can brush your teeth two times a day, does that mean that's the only times you can brush your teeth, like at morning and at night? You can brush them whenever you want to throughout the day, right? If you eat lunch, you eat kind of a garlicky bread for lunch. I hope you go brush your teeth, right? So just because you brush your teeth once in the morning and once at night, and maybe you pray once in the morning and once at night, is that the only times we can clean up and pray? No, we can do it any time of the day. In fact, the Bible has so many verses, so many that I, I'm not going to go through them all, but there's some in First Thessalonians, there's some in Luke, Philippians, that talks about praying all the time, praying without ceasing, never stop praying. And that's what we should be doing, guys. We got to keep those messes cleaned up, right? Right? All right, let's bow our heads. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning and to serve you, Lord. Lord, I pray for me and Miss Yana as we serve in the zone this morning, Lord, that the message would just minister to the lives of these students. Lord, I pray for Brother Wayne as he um, gives your word this morning, Lord, that somebody's heart and lives would be touched this morning, that they would leave here changed and a different person. Lord, we pray for all these things and pray that you um, get all the glory and honor and blessing out of it. For it's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, because of that reminder, I feel like we should just pray right now. Uh, it's just, God just laid it on my heart. I just think we just need to pray before we even get started, God. I just, I thank you for that reminder that we do need to clean our hearts, God, that we do need to pray to you, Lord. And I just ask that you would just clear our hearts, clear our minds, Lord, as we worship you this morning, God. Um, we just want you to be honored. We want you to be glorified. We just thank you for the opportunity just to be here, God, and just to worship you. And I pray that we always take that seriously. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Y'all may please stand. <clears throat>
Amen.
I agree. Brian, Brian said that sounded good, and that y'all were throwing it down this morning with that orchestra. <laughs> While the orchestra is finding their seat, uh, I just want to say a little bit about tonight's message while they're settling in before we start on this morning. Tonight we're going to look at this subject, words that never change. Words that never change. And we live in a time that is very confusing and everything's changing and who in the world knows what's going on. But tonight we want to give you a word of exhortation, of encouragement, how God has given us words that never change. But this morning... If you'll find your Bible and turn, as you see there on the screen, Matthew 5, 8, we're going to look at the pure in heart. The pure in heart. And when I started on this message, I was thinking really about what Christians, people that are already saved, how a child of God should approach that verse, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Because I'm not sure a lot of Christians know how that applies to us as we walk along as believers. But as I got into the text and started looking at the scriptures and seeing what all the Bible had to say about this subject, it had a lot to say to people that do not know the Lord. And so really what began to come about in my study was two messages. One that would really apply more to a gospel message how we would share somebody. And, and even if you are a Christian, uh, it'll teach you a lot. Sometimes there are Christians confused about certain things that we're going to cover today about our own heart and about the gospel presentation. But this morning, we're going to look at the one side of this, dealing with salvation. And I'm not going to do part two tonight. Who knows when I get around to part two. But I, as I'm going through this, I want you to think about as a Christian how this verse would apply to your life. But this morning, I hope that you will be praying with me that God would not only use this today if somebody does not know the Lord that is sitting here with us, that their heart would be open supernaturally to hear what it is that God has to say out of his word to them so that they could understand what God is providing for them in means of salvation. But not only that, because of our digital age, if you know somebody that is, you know, that does not know the Lord, you can just share, the, share a message like this with them and let them hear it. So they don't have to be here today for you to be able to take an evangelistic message that talks about the gospel and why we need the gospel and share it with them. You can go to our app as a platform and share that. So let's open with prayer, and then we will get into our text. Father, we thank you for the wonderful worship we had this morning. Father, thank you that we were able to bless your holy name and lift up our hearts in praise to you. And now, Father, as we come to the hour where we are going to look into your scripture, Father, we ask that your spirit would open our hearts. Father, I truly pray that hearts would be opened here today. And if somebody is among us that has never opened their heart to the joy of salvation, that, Father, that you would use this message to convict them of their great need. And, Father, we are going to trust you, Father, that as your word goes out, it will not come back void. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So you see the text very plainly. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a positive statement. I want to show you another verse. Hebrews 12, 14 says basically the same thing. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Now the purity and the holiness here that are talking about, again, is basically the same scriptural concept because holiness is the same word we get our word sanctification from, which God starts cleaning you up. God sets you aside. He saves you. He cleans you up. He sets you aside. Holiness, same idea of purity. Something has changed in your heart. It no longer holds on to the filth it once enjoyed, and you begin to have a pure heart. So in a positive way, the Bible says, blessed are those who find out what it is to have a pure heart because they will be allowed to see God. And on a negative side, those that do not figure this out and do not, uh, not necessarily mentally, but really reject it morally is what he's talking about, and do not desire holiness, do not allow, want God to clean them up, do not want to re repent, they will not see God. So whether you take the verse that says positively this is what it takes for you to see God, or whether you take the verse that negatively says if you don't do this, you will not see God, the Bible is consistent, not just in here, but in more than one place. There is a criteria upon which we will be allowed to see the Lord of all glory. 
Now, I want to ask you a very serious question. Do you ever think about this? When you read the Scripture, you have to be pure in heart to see God. Does the mind ever come on? Like, am I really pure in heart? Am I really qualified? Based off the Word of God and God's standard, am I going to be able to see God or have I just been doing something religious? And that's what we're going to look at this morning in very thorough detail by allowing the Word of God to shine upon this. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 5 says this, and see, God's standards have never changed. God is totally consistent on this subject from Genesis to Revelation. The psalmist said, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? In other words, same question. Who is able, and what are the qualifications for somebody to actually be able to go up to God and be in his presence? And this is what the Bible says, even back in Psalms, same thing. He who has clean hands and a pure heart. The person who does not lift up his soul in what, to what is false. And really, that's the definition. If you want to know what a pure heart is, we could break it down. And I'm not just going to spend a lot of time doing that because I just don't want that to mess up the flow of the message. But if you want to know what a pure heart is, it really has to do with something in your soul that's hitting away that is not right, that is not true, that is not lined up with what God says is the right standard. He who, does, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, he does not lift up his soul to what is false. He does not swear deceitfully. He will receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, which is basically the saying, the exact same thing that Matthew 5, 8 is. Again, God is always consistent in his word. If you want to be in the presence of God one day, you have to have a pure heart. You cannot have what is false in your life. You cannot have what is deceitful in your life. You cannot have false motives. You cannot be a hypocrite and ever stand in the presence of God. And those who are able to come to the knowledge of how to have this will receive the blessing of the Lord, which the Bible says is what? He will give you righteousness he will make you right in his sight and it will be the gift of salvation so when we're talking about pure in heart you say well what about the bible said but it's the same thing if you understand what salvation is and if you understand how to come to god for salvation that is how we will arrive at having our hearts cleaned so do you ever sit around and ask yourself why do you do the things you do i'm not talking about what you do i'm talking about your motive Let's get real. Even, even if you've been sitting here and say, oh, I've been a Christian for so many years, I don't need this. Okay. Again, you should get part two of this if it comes out one day. How does this apply to Christians? Okay, you're going to sit here and tell me when you think about what you do, and you're going to, in the criteria the Bible says plainly, it takes to walk into God's presence. And you can sit here and tell me, you have a pure heart. That the reason you, have you ever thought about why did I want to watch that on TV anyway? Have you ever just been scrolling along your phone as people are often to do? And maybe it isn't even somewhere terrible. Ooh, nice little piece of gossip. Have you ever thought why? Ooh, ooh, hey Tim, look what I heard about Bob. Have you ever asked yourself why did I want to know that? And why did I even want to share it with somebody? What is actually in my heart that I'm not willing to literally look at that makes me want to do the things that I do? Why do we look at what we look at? Why do we say the things we say to other people and about other people? Why do we do the things we do? Not just what did we do, but why in the world did I want to do it to start with? That's what Jesus is always trying to get to. He wants us to look in our lives and say, why am I really doing the wrong thing? And that is the very thing that we don't want to be confronted with, unfortunately. And so we need to be brave enough to actually take the mirror of God's holy word, let it show us his standard, and let it show us what our hearts are actually like. Does anybody want to go on a journey today to find out what your heart is actually like? It may not be a hallelujah time. But the Bible says the joy of it all that Jesus did not come to call those that are well, but those that are sick. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And what the modern day church has forgot is you got to help get people understand that they're lost before they're ever going to want to come and get saved. 
And that's the hard part. The hard part is being the doctor that has to come in there and say, oh, by the way, yes, you do have cancer. And we have a lot of pastors in pulpits today that are not willing to tell the truth about the cancer of sin that is going to not only kill you in this life, but to kill you eternally. And so, if you are brave enough, there's a really wonderful promise in the Bible, and it is this promise also found in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they should be comforted. The only way to understand the Bible is to put every single word within context of the whole story. And people will read that, and they'll say, blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. And almost every human thinks they're talking about somebody that goes through a bad time. That is not what the Bible is talking about. Well, if I go through some bad times, I'll be blessed. God will comfort me. That is not what the Bible is talking about. Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is given for the sole purpose that his people Israel would understand that they were lost without him. He said, if your righteousness does not exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And the Pharisees were much more religious than we are. So it has to take something greater than that. And Jesus, in that sermon, is trying to get a human to look at their own heart and recognize they need a Savior. And so when the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, it is talking about for the human being that is willing to look at their own heart and come before God and say, oh my goodness, I am so sorry, I am so wrong. And when we're willing to humble ourselves and say, we are wrong, we are wrong on the inside, we are wrong for what we think, we are wrong for what we say, it's not just what I did, God, it's why I did it that is broken. And when, when that gets a hold of you and you realize you're broken on the inside, if you really get it, it will make you mourn. And God says, that's right where you get your blessing. When you're willing to admit that and be broken like that over your own sin, now I can deal with you. Now I can help you because you've humbled yourself before me. And so as we look at this, we want to look at Mark 7, verse 14 and following. And Jesus called the people to him again, and he said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that is going into him that can defile him. But these things come out of a person are what defile him. The problem with religion is it can be a tool for the greatest deception on the man. Did you hear me? Religion can be the greatest tool for deception known to man. Wait a minute, I thought religion was good. Religion is the number one tool Satan uses to send people to hell. Religion. That's what Jesus taught. I don't know, I, I thought the church taught something different. Well, you've been told wrong. Jesus was trying to teach people religion is what the, the Pharisees and others use to keep people bound. The Pharisees had been out there saying, well, these people, your disciples, they're wrong. They're not right because they're not washing their hands. And if they're not washing their hands, they're not ceremonially clean. And so what they're eating is wrong. And so therefore they're wrong. We're right. You're wrong. And Jesus said, not only that, but many other traditions. And probably somewhere in your life, some religion of some kind has laid on your mind and heart Many traditions. If I do this, and if I do this, and if I do this, I'll be right with God. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell his disciples. See, religion teaches that if we clean up the outside, if we follow specific rules, if we make certain sacrifices, if we do certain good deeds, then we're going to be clean and okay with God. Paul explained this in Galatians 2.16 when you put it into a gospel context Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. You're not going to work yourself through a law. Is a, is a law. Like, what's a law? Don't speed. Or do this or don't do that. That's what a law is. Now, the Jewish law had many laws. They were God's holy standard. They're just. They're right. They're true. But you and I are not going to clean up our heart by keeping rules. That's the problem. And so... It goes on to say 
So we have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Why? Very plainly and specifically, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. There's no way to work your way into God's good graces. Now we, as a species, since the fall, we prefer to think that we do what we do in this life, not because of something in us, but because of some external cause. And if nothing else today, this is a psychology masterclass. If you want to get, it, get into some real true psychology of why people do what they do, the world always wants to say, oh, well, little Johnny, his daddy tied his shoes too tight. The Bible says no. You do what you do, and I do what I do, because there's something in here that's broken. And as long as you blame it on somebody else, it takes all the guilt off of you. But hey, let me tell you something that's real sweet and good. Yeah, you had the benefit of blaming somebody else for your actions. And as long as you blame somebody else for your anger, and for your whatever it is you're doing, that's real nice because you don't have to blame yourself. But there's one problem with that. You can't ever be free of it because you've given the control of your soul over to somebody else. You'll never get your soul free until you take responsibility for your own actions. That's the way God meant it to work. The day you're able to say, I don't care what I've been through, it's my fault. My reaction is my fault. Now, what they did to me is their fault. But how I respond comes out of my heart. That's my fault. And you'll never get free of somebody else, what they did to you, until you're willing to take responsibility for your own actions. And that's why God gave us a way if we're willing to confess, willing to humble, humble ourselves, we have a way to freedom. Man's mindset in America, and unfortunately this is coming through many pulpits in America today, even though it is not true, but the mindset is, and you probably hear this, if not, I want you to start paying attention to it, because I, unfortunately I hear it coming out of so much garbage that is being preached in America, and this is what it is. Man is basically good. The humanist philosophy that fills all of America. For all of its divisions, most all of Americans right now are basically in agreement in their philosophy that man is basically good. So many pulpits are preaching today. Man is basically good. He just made some mistakes and Jesus comes along to help us with our mistakes. We prefer to believe that we are good people. We just made a mistake and God understands. That's all sounds great. Don't that just sound good? I'm a pretty good person. You know, everybody's human. Have you ever heard that? I hear it all the time. Oh, it, I, I, what do you expect? I'm human. They lied. They, they did all kind of mess. People do all kind of mess. Oh, what do you expect? I'm only human. That's the man's philosophy nowadays. I'm human. I'm a pretty good person. Don't it just sound so good? God understands. He's full of grace. He's full of love. God understands. He knows. I just made a mistake. Don't we all make mistakes? Don't you want to give some grace? Oh, yes, we do want to give some grace. But if you believe that version of it, you've believed the lie. Because God says your heart is black and you need to be saved. That's the big difference between saying, oh, I just made a little mistake. I'm a pretty good person. Or, you know, well, why did Jesus have to die if we're pretty good people? While the hubba, if it, that's, that's what Galatians was saying. If we could work ourselves to God, he would have told us how to be nice. But if the Bible is true and our hearts are broken and our hearts is full of wickedness, then the very Son of God had to go die on a cross to save us. And then God says, all you have to do to be saved is to be willing to admit you are broken. That's why Jesus was very plain. I come to call sinners, not the righteous. That's the requirement of God. You're like, oh, so, no, it ain't hard at all. It's so easy. All you have to do is get over your own pride and admit you're wrong. Admit that God is right about the condition of our hearts. Now let's pick it up in verse 17. Jesus goes on to explain this to us because his disciples didn't understand what he was saying because it was their tradition that when you do certain things on the outside that determines whether you're clean. Well, I ate the wrong food. I'm not clean. And when Jesus had entered the house, he left the people. And so now he's just with his disciples. And he, 
his disciples asked him about the parable, and he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? And brothers and sisters, let me assure you, many people are without understanding on this subject, even in the church. He says, Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from without cannot defile him, since it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean, and he said, Notice, this is Jesus telling us what is actually wrong with humanity. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from where? Where? Within. Where? Out of the heart of man. What, what comes out of the heart of man? Evil thoughts. I thought those come from, from, from the stuff I was watching on TV. I thought that was somebody else's fault. No, your evil thoughts are your fault. Uh, what about sexual immorality? Oh, that comes from this. No, no, no. That comes from your heart and my heart. What about theft? Oh, wh where does stealing come from? Oh, let me go get somebody that's a pseudo-psychologist that don't read the Word of God and let us explain why little Johnny's a thief. No, anybody that steals, steals because it's in their heart to steal. Now, they may have had a bad circumstance and they may have been taught the wrong thing. But the truth is... The way to get right with that is not to quit blaming society, to continue to blame society for what we do, is to come to a holy God and say, God, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm responsible. I'm, and to, you know what the world is doing? And we see it at all in our, what is our world doing through Satan right now to the American population? Telling everybody it's somebody else's fault. Do you know where that's going to get us in being a godly nation? Nowhere. It's going to get much worse. Until we as a church are able to tell people, you want to be free? It's easy to be free. Take responsibility for your own actions. Come before God and tell God you are wrong because that's what God says. God says you do what you do because your heart wants to do the wrong thing. Theft, murder, adultery, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, even things that are inside that... We may not think this that bad, but the Bible says they're terribly bad. The envy we have, the slander we produce, the pride in our own heart, the foolishness, all these evil things, what come from within, and that's what corrupts us. The Bible says what comes out of our heart is what corrupts us. Now, Colossians 2.23 has a beautiful summary statement about this subject. It says, these have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Now in Colossae, Paul was having to warn them about leaving the simplicity of following Jesus and going back to some ritualistic, hey, what day of the week is I'm supposed to do this? And what kind of food am I supposed to eat? And what am I supposed to do this? And he said, hey, when you come to Christ, you should have left those elemental things that were only a picture of who Jesus was supposed to be. But notice what it says, that they have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In summary, what Paul was trying to teach them is that outward religious practices, notice it says they have an appearance of wisdom. You know what religion looks like to a man? A mighty good answer to our problem. Paul said that. If you don't know what Paul's saying in Colossians 2.23, he is saying to a human being, religion actually looks like wisdom. Re do it. Hey, I'll clean my act up. I, I'll stop doing this. I'll start doing that. I, I'll be a better person. I'll look like a good person in the community. Paul says that kind of religion looks like wisdom, but he says there's one problem with it, and don't miss this. He said the problem is that it has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. It does not change the cravings of our... You know what the religion cannot do for you that you and I need? Do you know what religion cannot do for you that you and I must have? It cannot give us a pure heart. That's why Jesus came and when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he says, Oh, you have heard thou shalt not commit adultery. But whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her in his heart, I tell you, has committed adultery with her already. And he handles anger the same way. 
What are you and I going to do when we stand before God in our heart? Oh, we can look squeaky clean at church. We can look squeaky clean to our family. We can look squeaky clean to everybody else. But what happens when a holy God looks in our heart and says, In your heart you lust. In your heart you hate. In your heart you envy. In your heart you have malice. In your heart is why you watch that garbage on TV. In your heart is why you talk about people you're not supposed to. In your heart is why you do the things that you do and you are not pure before me and you will not enter my presence. If that doesn't scare you, you're not like me because it scares me. See, I don't know what happened to preaching in America when it was good preaching that got to people's consciences. Somewhere we wanted to make everybody feel good and draw a crowd. That's okay. You can have a crowd and go to hell. But Jesus comes so that people did not have to go to hell. Jesus come to save people from hell, but the only way people can be saved from hell is to actually know what the Bible says. And the Bible says that there's something inside us that is broken and needs to be fixed and can only be fixed by God himself. See, this may not bother you, but as I read, but when I read, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. And I see what Jesus says about my heart. And when I look at what I do and why I do what I do, I know he is telling the truth and I know how I have a problem I cannot fix myself. Can I honestly tell you, if I depend on my own goodness, if I depend on my own works, if I depend on my own religion, I am going to hell. That's what the Bible teaches. Now, I know a lot of churches aren't teaching that today. That's what Jesus taught. That's what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. That if we try to do it on our own, we will not get there. I will go to hell because of what is in my heart, and I will deserve to go there. When I was thinking about this this morning, I was thinking about a song Miss Morales sings, and in the end she says, Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. When we hear the word of God preached in its truth and accepted for what it says, we should stand before God and say, Oh God, there is no way I will ever be able to stand in your presence knowing what is in my own heart. I am so condemned. I am so guilty. But then the champion of heaven has come down. Perfect. God's own son always promised, lived a perfect life. Killed by sinful, hateful men because of what's in the heart of man that does not want to listen to God and went to a cross and died there for me and shed his blood and come out of a grave. And now God says, I will offer you salvation. I will clean your heart, not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus Christ did. And the Bible asks us to admit we're wrong and trust Jesus alone. And when we do that, when all of my guilt comes cascading upon me, when all of my thoughts of knowing that my heart is not clean, my motives are not right, that there is something broken in my heart, just like Jesus said there was, when I admit that, but I accept Jesus, and when all the guilt should come upon me, I think of Jesus, and I think, not guilty. I'm not guilty because of what I've done. That's the difference in religion and salvation. Religion says, well, I'm a pretty good person. I did this and this and this. God will be okay. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says you are guilty. You must be saved. The Bible is asking people, who wants to be saved? Who wants to say, I need a Savior? And this isn't the first place that God told us this. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, I want you to understand something about our human heart. I've heard this quoted a lot. But I hope that this will give you some insight into what it actually means. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? God says, I, the Lord, search the heart and I test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So once again, can I challenge you? If you say, I believe the Bible, consider what the Bible says. The same Bible that says our hearts must be pure to see God says this about the human heart. 
It is deceitful above all things. Do you understand what the Bible just told you and I? The Bible says the number one quality of what do you think the number one quality of your heart is? Oh, I'm pretty, I'm a pretty good person. Oh, I'm compassionate. Oh, 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 whatever. I'm courageous. God's said the number one quality of the human heart above all things, the Bible, not Wayne. Above all things, your heart is deceitful. Now, let's, let's just think about this for a minute. I'm trusting in my own goodness and my own heart to get me to heaven. And God says, above all things, your heart is going to lie to you. Do you know what that means? If you're trusting in your own heart to get you to heaven, you're trusting a lie. <laughs> if you're trusting in your own goodness to get to heaven, your own heart is lying to you. Your own heart is going to reach, snatch you right down into hell. You know who, who's going to get you into hell? Not somebody else. Believing your own heart and not the Word of God. Because above all things, your heart is telling you, you're not bad, you're good enough, you're okay, you're fine, it's okay with you, don't worry about it, don't listen to that preacher, don't listen to anybody else, you're a pretty good old person. And your heart is telling you that. But the word deceitful comes from a word that means unsteady ground. That means what the Bible is telling us that when we trust our own heart, we're standing on unsteady ground and our heart is going to let us down. It's going to put us in a place where we will be condemned for what we do. This means if you're trusting in the goodness of your own heart, that you are a and that you're a good person, that God is going to accept you on that basis, that you're standing on unsteady ground. The punishment for leaving this world without admitting you're a sinner and putting your faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible is very plain that you will go into an eternal punishment to pay for the sins that you have committed, the wrong of your heart, not just the things you're doing, but the things that are in you, that without Jesus Christ can never be clean. That's why hell never ends, because the debt... When Jesus hung on the cross, he said the debt is paid. Hell goes on. Say, so why does hell go on to ever? Because you'll never get the debt paid because you can't pay it yourself. So when you go to say, oh, no, I'm good enough. Well, you're going to stand before God with a debt that can never be paid. Let me tell you a little something about hell if nobody's to told you the Bible lately. The Bible says that hell will be a place that is without light. The Bible says that hell is going to be a place without God, according to the book of Thessalonians. That is one of the key characteristics. God won't be there. And you may not think that matters to you because you may not think you need God. But, but you don't know God's being good to you right now, even though you don't think he is. And the moment you wake up and God is not in your life and God is not on this planet and God is not in your presence forever, it is going to be unbelievably horrifying. Just without the presence of ever having God around no more chance to find well i don't know if there's a god or not buddy you leave this world without understanding and putting your faith in this you will find out for all eternity what it's like to be without god do you want to reject god he'll let you reject him forever do you want to base your eternity on what the scientists have told you about that have you looked out there the world and what the world knows and how the world acts little children you're letting the world tell you what to believe and not believe about God. Have you looked at the world and seen that the world is not that smart? The world is trying to lead you to hell. Listen to the Word of God. Not only will it be a place of anguish, it will be full of fire. And I think the worst thing about hell is that the, Jesus said more than one time, it will be a place where the worm does not die. The worm does not die. You know what I believe that really speaks of? I'm, I'm, I've thought about this for, for years. I'm very convinced based off other scriptures. That means that when you reject Christ and you say I'm good enough without Jesus Christ, it means when you are eternally condemned, your mind will be eat by your conscience forever. You're going to be a conscious being in hell, according to the Word of God. You're not going to lose consciousness. Have you ever done something wrong and your conscience eat at you? Is there anything much worse than knowing you've really done something bad and you've hurt somebody and you want to get over it? And we've probably all done things. Have you ever just had your conscience eat you 
and eat you and eat you. If you are comfortable with going to hell without God, let me just be honest with you because Jesus was honest with us. You're going to go to a place where forever you will be reminded, I could have been saved. I could have admitted I was a sinner. I could have agreed with the Bible. I could have come to Jesus for salvation. I could have put my faith and hope and trust in Jesus and been wonderfully saved, but I rejected God, and now I am here, and forever and ever and ever and ever, you will consciously know, I made the wrong decision. Where the, it's a picture of a worm. Could you imagine being strapped and somebody putting a worm on you and it eats on you forever? Hell is going to be a worm in your mind. You say, oh, that's horrible. That's not... Jesus said it, and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You've rejected the truth, and so forever it will eat on your mind that you could have been saved, but you decided not to be. So forever that will haunt us. So what do we need to do? To be saved. And this is beautiful. Jeremiah 4.14. Oh, it's so easy. The only thing hard about being saved is people admitting that they're wrong. We We do not want to accept what God has to say about what's inside of us. That's why Jesus, again, was very plain. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Sinners come right to Jesus. People that think they're okay, ignore him. And usually the main reason they ignore him is they think they're pretty good and they got religion. But this is what Jesus said. I mean, Jeremiah said. It's the same story. Oh, Jerusalem, what do you need to do? You need to wash your heart from evil that you can be saved. How long shall wicked thoughts lodge within you? You know what that's talking about? What the Bible calls in the New Testament repentance. 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 I am willing to take the things that I know and are wrong and bring them before God and say, Oh God, wash me. I am no longer trying to justify the evil that is in my own heart and soul. I'm willing to admit it to God and say, God, I'm wrong. I need to be washed. I need to be clean. I need to be saved. I need to be helped. And so in Jeremiah 7, 7 and 8, which was right before the text, many people know about the deceitful heart. But it's all part of one text. Jeremiah 17 is a beautiful chapter. If you hadn't read it lately, I would encourage you to read it because it's about this subject. But actually, God tells us how to be saved before he tells us the problem is with our hearts. Is why those who will not be saved are not. But this is the answer to man's salvation. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord whose trust is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, and it does not cease to bear fruit. So how do we get through life and we do not worry about what is to come? How can we live when we know that our heart is corrupt? We no longer trust ourselves, but we trust God. See, God had a perfect relationship with man in the garden where man was supposed to live in simple faith and trust and fellowship with God. And then Satan tempted man one day to say, No, God, I know what's best. I'll take of the fruit. I'm a pretty smart cookie. I can do it on my own. And from that point on, that's what's been in the human heart. No, that's okay, God. I got it figured out. I'm a pretty smart cookie. I can do it on my own. And salvation is God restoring us, not just cleansing us from our sins, but putting us back into a right frame of mind where we no longer have a rebellious spirit. You know, the Bible says before you're saved, you're at enmity with God. That's another thing most people don't want to understand. Oh, no, I love God. No, if you're not saved, if you've never come and confessed your sins and asked Christ to save you and come into your heart, the Bible says you are at enmity. That means you're at odds with God himself. Why? Why? Because you're still saying, I can do it myself. If you've never humbled yourself before God, that's what you're still saying. God, no, no, that's okay, God. I got this. I got it on my own. I don't need you. And God is saying, do you want to be saved? Then trust me. 
Trust that God wants to save you from hell by providing salvation. Trust that salvation only comes through Jesus Christ. There is no greater folly in this world than to think that we can ab obtain salvation by the works that we do. And if you think you can, go back and examine your own heart and say, if there is a God and His standard is purity of heart to stand in His presence, then how can I do it? You do it by trusting Him. See, there's another beatitude that covers this. It says, blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just like most people don't understand when it says, blessed are those who, are, who mourn, it's talking about sin. When the Bible says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, a lot of people are thinking about, man, that's great, because uh, the American government uh, overtaxed me and I'm broke. <laughs> no, it didn't say poor in your bank account. <laughs> the Bible says, do you want to be blessed by God right now this morning? It's simple. God said, blessed are the poor in spirit. You know what that means? That means all you have to do is admit that you're spiritually bankrupt before God. Now, that might be a hard pill to swallow if it wasn't true. But if it is true, it's one of the greatest mercies and blessings we could ever have. Oh, God. Do you know why? Because God's merciful. God is saying, if you'll just be real with me, if you'll just be honest with me, if you'll just confess to me, I will not reject you. I will accept you. And the only thing that's standing in between you and salvation and knowing God this morning is what is in your own heart. Of whether or not you're willing to accept the Savior or whether you're going to turn and harden your heart and reject the Savior of your soul and say, no, that's okay, God. I have it. I can do this on my own. So let me say to you, if you want to have a pure heart, trust God. Trust God that in Jesus Christ, He will clean you up. But do not trust yourself. Let's stand together. Our men are going to come down. Miss Allie's going to come and play. The only way somebody can be saved is be, to be drawn by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God draws people by the preaching of the Word of God. When people hear the truth, I don't believe in manipulation tactics. I don't believe in emotional gimmicks. My faith and confidence is in Jesus Christ and His Word and what He proclaimed. I want to open an invitation to you this morning that if the Spirit of God spoke to your heart, if the Spirit of God told you, you know what? The Bible's right. The things you do, they're not somebody else's fault. They come out of your own heart. But God in His mercy has given us a way to get clean from those. And you may not even understand what that's all about. You may need to understand more about who Christ is. But if you were under any kind of conviction this morning, I would ask that you would just come. Come and talk to one of these men. I would not leave here today knowing that my heart is not pure before the Lord. Not when there's an opportunity to be right with the Holy God. And these men are down here. If you have a need in your life, if you have a burden, I would ask that you would come during this moment of invitation and let them pray for you.
because some are still here. Maybe you just before we leave today, maybe you just want to thank God. Maybe you haven't thought about it in a while, what was in your own motives and in your own life and what God was willing to cleanse you of. If you've prayed no other prayer today before God during this hymn of invitation, I would encourage you, if you know him, to rejoice and say, God, thank you that you saved me. Thank you that you cleaned up my filthy heart so that I can stand before you. And as a Christian, I hope that even though we didn't preach that part of the message, I hope it's turned a light on in your eyes that now as a Christian, I should desire to live with a clean and pure heart before God. No more foolishness, no more lies, no more hypocrisy, but letting the God of the universe sanctify me totally and clean me up so that I could be a useful vessel for his honor and glory. Oh, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you do not lie to us, but you have told us the truth about who you are, about who we are, and that, Father, even in our depravity, you've made a way. Father, I pray that if somebody's here today and they heard this message, and maybe they didn't want to come down, maybe they were embarrassed, maybe they were confused, but, Father, if there's somebody here today and they do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, if they never considered the doctrine of the Bible that we are not good people, that we need a Savior. I pray that that message would not leave their hearts before it has done its work in their life, whether it's this week or next week or next month. But in your time, oh God, let the fruit of this word take hold so that people can be saved. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tonight.